There we are. Good evening. My name is Barbara McDade, and I'm with the League of Women Voters of Maine, Bangor area. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. We are hosting this uh, candidates forum tonight for the empty, uh, the vacant seat on uh, Bangor City Council. Uh, the term will run until November 2023. We have five candidates running for the position. And uh, we are all masked because of the pandemic, but we have headshots of everyone and they will be on the Facebook page tomorrow. I'd like to just go over some of the ground rules for tonight's uh, forum. All participants will refrain from personal attacks and will focus on the issues. The candidates will observe all time limits. Uh, each candidate will have three minutes for an opening statement. Candidates drew uh, for the order um, that they will answer the first question. After the opening statements, uh, the moderator will shuffle uh, the order the candidates speak. So no candidate is always first. Each candidate will have two minutes uh, to answer, to present a closing statement. And the first question has been prepared in advance. Um, the candidates will be uh, timed by a volunteer. Questions from the audience must be submitted in writing. And Valerie Carter is back there. She has index cards and a pen. Um, so if you write your question and then give it to her, she will bring it up to me. Uh, we did get questions beforehand, uh, both through me, through the league website and through uh, the city website. Um, a question may be posed to a single candidate, but all the candidates will be given an opportunity to comment or respond to the question. Um, I think that's all that we need to uh, now. Oh, please, from the audience, um, no, no personal video taping or audio taping of the candidates. Uh, this will be running on the city uh, Facebook page and on its uh, other communications and broadcast on, on its cable television network. Um, I will tell you that each candidate will give, be given three minutes for an introductory statement. Then each candidate will be given two minutes to answer the prepared question. And then uh, that will be followed by the questions from the public and candidates will be given two minutes to answer each of the public's questions. After the public question, each candidate will be given two minutes for a closing statement, and we will end uh, whether we have uh, used all the audience questions or not at eight o'clock. So we will begin, we will begin in alphabetical order for each um, <clears throat> candidate to give their uh, uh, introductory statement, and it's three minutes. And Stephen, if we could start with you, Stephen Bro. Good evening. I'm Stephen Bro, and I'm running for city. Oh, just. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, sorry. <laughs> I'm Stephen Bro, and I'm running for city council to represent the forgotten people of our city, the taxpayers. In the last four years, nearly every person I spoke with feels city council just doesn't consider them. They set the budget and mill rate without regard to what the increased taxes do to the fixed income seniors, the disabled, and the young family just trying to afford their first homes. Bangor is simply getting too expensive for these people. I want to put the city council on a diet like a salary cap in pro sports. We have a mill rate of $22.30 per thousand at 100% valuation, and it's going up for the new budget. I want to cap it except for cost of living adjustments for city employees, unless by voter approval on specific items put out by council for voters to decide themselves. We know how much money we can spend based on current valuation, and council can only spend that much, plus the COLA, period. Juggle the budget line items to fit under that cap. Any items that won't fit must be sent out for voter approval. Nine people shouldn't be the sole deciders of any tax increase. You, the voter, should. Let your vote count as much as mine. It's time for change to make your voice heard, and I have a plan to do just that. I'll give voters greater 
authority and incentive to show up and vote on their tax dollars. We had 13% voter turnout in 2019. While I and other candidates were surprised, the city clerk wasn't. We can and must do better. And I've heard the comments and concerns that that could cause my taxes to go up or my project won't happen. My response is simply, not if you and like-minded friends and neighbors show up and vote. I'll be the voice of the individual taxpayer, personal or business. I'm here to listen to what you feel is our highest priority. What can we afford with inflation on food, gas, taxes, heating oil, and electricity? Don't forget people on fixed income are struggling worse than all of us, and renters will feel this cost passed on by their landlords. Affordable housing will all but disappear. I'll listen to you first on what the capped rate is spent on, then let voters decide anything else. That's the message I use to get on the ballot this spring. Two questions. Does council try to communicate with you? Can you even name all the current eight? If you can't, that's a marketing problem going beyond their own circles. I'm different, I listen, and it's time for change. Looking out for seniors, the disabled, young families, and giving voters more control over their taxes. That's who I am. I want to hear from you as your next city councilor on Messenger at Stephen M. Bro for Bangor City Council. Message phone 207-735-6130. Email Stephen Bro for Bangor City Council at Outlook.com. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will remind um, the candidates to make sure their microphone is on. Uh, there's a button to push on your microphone and a green light will come on when you're ready to speak. Uh, Joseph Leonard. Um, thank you. I want to thank the League of Women Voters for organizing this forum. I, I know there was a lot of last minute changes leading up to this forum, and I really appreciate uh, your hard work to make this night possible. And uh, for everyone watching this forum and attending here, I, I want to thank all of you for your participation viewing this forum tonight. My name is Joseph Leonard, and I want to represent you in these council chambers. I love Bangor and I want to offer my servitude to this city. I grew up here and graduated from John Baptist Memorial High School in 2008. Afterwards, I moved on to study at the University of Maine in Orono. I also joined the ROTC program at the University of Maine where I graduated in 2012 and commissioned as an officer in, in the United States Army. I spent the majority of my working adult life in the United States Army where I focused on leading soldiers on multiple missions that required heavy amounts of planning, logistical cooperation, time management, and as a leader, developed a work philosophy that encourages working smarter over working harder. I am very proud of the work that was achieved and feel honored to have been awarded multiple times for my service. Yet I know success is only achievable with the help, insight, and experience of everyone involved. And that important lesson is why I want to be your counselor. I do not want to be a leader of this community for the sake of being a leader. I know how to lead. Leadership is representing the ideas, plans, and experiences of everyone. Bangor deserves to have its citizens properly represented, which is why I believe Bangor deserves to have a clear representation by introducing wards for city council races and also being able to vote for a city mayor. Every issue that we discuss tonight is directly related to that single issue that Bangor does not have proper executive representation in this city. If you want a city councilor who's going to fight for your right, to have your opinions to be better represented in a democratic process, then you need to vote for Joseph Leonard on June 14th. Thank you very much. Thank you. Michael Mayberry. Thank you all. Hello uh, to all watching tonight uh, in the audience and virtually, I appreciate your attendance tonight. I first wanted to thank the League of Women Voters uh, of Maine for sponsoring tonight's candidate forum. It's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate being able to share my thoughts on the great city of Bangor and the future I envision if elected. I appreciate uh, that I'm able to stand here, sorry, well, sit here actually, with uh, my fellow candidates after having spoken to so many residents within the city about my stances, and I'm now able to share them with this greater audience. I've always had a passion for local government, and as a parent, uh, I wanted to show my son the importance of getting involved when you have the desire to help. Thank you, Stephen for bringing up young families 
this is an important issue uh, in this city. Um, as a young family myself, I have a lot of uh, background and expertise and passion for this particular area. I'm also someone who is originally from Maine, have lived in various areas up and down the Eastern seaboard before settling here in Bangor. I truly believe in this community because I want to, and I live here and I'm dedicated to it. As well, my background in education provides me with the foundation for creative solutions and what I believe to be the most important focal points for individuals to be successful within communities. I believe that city council is most effective when it elevates all voices and perspectives. My goal would be to listen and understand the needs of all citizens within the city. In my travels collecting signatures to get on the ballot, I heard some common themes and concerns and or expectations of counselors. Communication, the needing to be clear and transparent uh, and more frequent in communication. Affordable housing, wrap around city resources and refocusing efforts and advancements back to our neighborhoods. There has been a great deal of emphasis on redevelopment of downtown and the residents that I spoke with wanted more attention paid to their own neighborhoods. If elected, my work would be emphasizing solutions that focus on the folks who live within these residential areas as they best understand their individual communities. This is not to say that there isn't a consideration for downtown businesses, but I would hope to bring residential areas back to the forefront of conversations. My conversations with residents centered on feelings forgotten in the focus of business development. It is often as simple as more attention paid to parks, sidewalks, and roads. Often these interests and issues are interconnected. For instance, housing affordability in Bangor forces individuals and families who would enjoy the entertainment and access to resources into surrounding communities. This often makes it difficult to work in Bangor. And this lack of employees has been seen to hurt local businesses and other companies that rely on our labor force. As well, Bangor as a city is a hub for Eastern Maine. And we should be advocating at the state level for more resources to ensure that we have the tools to assist those in need. This includes our police, social services, and local agencies. In closing. Thank you, Michael. Daniel Smith. Hi, my name is Daniel Smith. I want to thank the League of Women Voters for having me here tonight. And I also want to thank uh, Sarah Dubé for her service to the city of Bangor and the city council. Um, I wish we didn't have to be here tonight to fill her seat. Uh, with that being said, um, I am a citizen of Bangor. I was born and raised in Bangor. I've lived here my whole life. I went to Bangor schools and I had two sons that went to Bangor schools. From what I'm hearing so far, I can tell you the solution. Look, there's nothing, there's no problems, there's only solutions, okay? And one of the biggest solutions that we could do, it's called a citizen satisfaction survey. And they do work. You could check it under clear point strategy. There's many benefits to it. I was a member of the 1979 state championship team at Bangor High School. We took the state 42 to eight. We sang that all the way home. I love Bangor. Bangor has some of the greatest people in the world. And I mean that sincerely. And some of the smartest people in the world. Okay, we can draw from that. We need to unify. We need unity in Bangor. And I also want to say that in the multitude of council, there is safety. I want to say that again. In the multitude of council, there is safety. I appreciate what the city council does. Okay? We're, we have some trying times coming. We all see it. Okay? We got to work together. We got to unify. We see the high prices out there, the gas prices, inflation. We know what's coming down the road. They're talking about recession. Okay? So we've got to... We got to put our heads together and come up with a plan. I can do that. I've owned businesses in Bangor. Okay. I've managed businesses. Okay. I just want to give back to the community that gave to me my whole life. I had great teachers, great coaches, great friends. 
teammates. I love Bangle. I bleed crimson and white. I know they call it cardinal and white now, but to me, it's crimson and white. So I know together that the city of Bangor can come up with solutions to move us forward in the future. And that's why I'm asking for your vote to be put on the Bangor City Council. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Tyler Rowe. Good evening. Thank you to Barbara and the League of Women Voters for sponsoring this candidate forum. Uh, thank you to Nancy, our timekeeper here tonight. Uh, special thanks to my partner, uh, Rebecca Smart, who's been my rock during this campaign. Couldn't, couldn't have done it without you, Rebecca, and thanks for coming out here tonight. Um, I want to thank the city of Bangor for use of the space here tonight, and thanks to each and every one of you who came out here tonight, both in person and online on Facebook, to learn more about us, the candidates who are vying for the open position on your city council. I hope I can earn your vote with my unique vision for Bangor tonight. I'd like to start off by recognizing Sarah Dubé, our former city councilor, who we tragically lost this past year. My sincere condolences to her husband and family. No one can fill her shoes, and I hope to follow in her footsteps in the legacy she left on our community as an organizer who loved her city and gave a voice to all the people of Bangor. Again, my name is Tyler Rowe, and I look forward to representing you on city council. I've been talking to so many of you over the past few months, and we've had lots of great conversations at your doorsteps, at our comprehensive plan meetings, and our city visioning sessions that the city planning officer, Ann Craig, has been hosting. So thank you, Ann. Um, I've, I've learned so much from so many of you. We've shared some laughs, casual talk about sports, the Celtics recently, you know, our weather, and most importantly, our ideas for how to continue to make Bangor a great place to live for all of us. I've listened to you as you've shared your highlights of what makes Bangor great. Our amazing schools, our beautiful neighborhoods, our lovable and walkable downtown and our culture. And we're a city that affords us lots of opportunity while maintaining that small town vibe that so many of us enjoy. I've listened to you as you've shared your concerns about the shortage of housing in the city, the lack of affordable homes and rentals and the associated homelessness issue, and your concerns about some of our basic infrastructure needs. I'd be honored to serve you as we build a city where young people can graduate from our local high schools and colleges and feel like Bangor affords them the opportunity to get a well-paying job. Where young people, young, where people young and old can start a business like I did, where existing businesses can expand their services. And while a lot of people work in Bangor, we have been losing population. As your city councilor, I have several proposals that I'll talk about tonight to address our population loss and increase our tax base so that Bangor continues to be a hub for Eastern and Central Maine. As I said before, I'm a business owner. I started a delivery business in March of 2020 as COVID started sweeping through our country and our city. I started this business because I saw a need and wanted to meet the needs of, of my community, and a community that had changed drastically in the spring of 2020. I'm an experienced leader. I've held many management positions with several companies, and I have a finance back, background, working with people buying their homes for the first time, working as a lender with businesses to start or expand their reach. And on June 14th, I hope you'll vote Tyler Rowe, problem solver and a man who loves his city. Thank you very much. <clears throat> now we will uh, switch and um, have the candidates answer the question, what do you think is the most pressing problem the city is currently facing? And what do you think some viable solutions are? And Mike Mayberry, could you go first? Thank you. So I believe that affordable housing uh, is... I believe that affordable housing is uh, one of the top issues uh, facing the city of Bangor in this moment. Um, I truly believe I've worked in education uh, in student housing for um, almost 15 years now. Uh, I've worked with students who try to uh, move off campus, find it difficult to live in the local community. Uh, here in Bangor, but elsewhere. Um, having a roof over your head is priority number one. That is what people need to be successful and what we're finding difficult to do here in the city of Bangor. Um, I think I have a couple of ideas that highlight some efforts that I hope uh, would alleviate some of this concern. I think that uh, having folks who live in residential areas have more uh, resources to 
rent to provide affordable housing within their own areas rather than individuals who buy property from out of state who are landlords in name only uh, who do not keep their properties who uh, find it difficult to um, ensure the safety of their property um, it makes for uh, our property values to decrease at times uh, and makes it challenging to live in this city also uh, it's really un uh, not affordable uh, in many ways to be a citizen here in Bangor uh, because of that housing cost and likely pushes folks out uh, and drives folks to not maybe work here in the city, uh, which is a challenge. I think that there is a gap between rent costs and amenities and we need to focus on keep, keeping investing in properties uh, as well as holding landlords accountable uh, to their uh, concerns from the neighbors in the neighborhoods. I think we should be working with local and state agencies to address rental assistance and providing assistance in becoming a landlord yourself. I think the solutions are within our neighborhoods and the people who live in this city know how to fix it. And my goal as your city councilor would be to help you find that solution. Thank you. Uh, next, Joseph Leonard, uh, do you need me to repeat the question? Um, no. Uh, so, um, besides fighting to make Bangor's elections more representative, uh, Bangor, like many cities across the country, needs to address its infrastructure issues, such as economic infrastructure, which is incorporating roads, sidewalks, maintenance, and small business support, technical infrastructure, such as evolving uh, the city's website, developing city mobile apps for smartphones, and moving toward affordable universal internet access, and three, human infrastructure, such as expanding social services, providing more police training, expanding public housing, and creating more public programs with good paying jobs. Achieving these major goals related to infrastructure can only be done when we work together as a community. Bangor prides itself in being a city that has been self-reliant dependable and filled with hardworking people. And in that time, Bangor has been pivotal, pivotal in growing its surrounding towns to prosperity. So many towns around the area have increased their populations and that is solely because we act as the central hub here in Bangor. And much like military leadership, these goals can uh, be effective when we have proper representation at a diplomatic level. If these issues that I just talked about are to be properly addressed with expediency, we must evolve and give Bangor the proper representation it needs by having an elected mayor and having city councils that have ward districts. No changes come easily, but I will fight hard to make sure Bangor's voters have the representation they deserve. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Tyler Rowe, what do you think is the most pressing problem the city is currently facing? And what do you think some viable solutions are? Uh, many Bangor residents and myself agree that the shortage of housing in Bangor is one of our biggest challenges at the moment. Um, I have two major pr proposals uh, to address this issue. And the first one's fairly simple in conjunction with our city staff and, and uh, zoning board. Um, we can address some of our current and re-examine our existing zoning regulations and adopt more of a mixed use approach to our zoning. Uh, this will allow businesses to um, more ably coexist with, with existing uh, residential areas and allow us to, to develop more res residential spaces uh, where there are businesses currently, specifically in our downtown. Um, my other major proposal is a, uh, something I'm calling the Building a Better Bangor program. And this would, as many of you know, uh, Bangor's received uh, kind of a one-time use, uh, $20 million in, in COVID relief funds. And my proposal is to allow up to 200 grants of $100,000 each. You heard that right, $100,000 each with priority given to Bangor residents and regional residents to build, expand, and develop new four plus unit rental properties. We have a housing shortage and the only way to deal with that issue and to bring the cost of renting and living in Bangor is to increase the supply of our rental properties. 
Bangor has ample areas that are undeveloped or underdeveloped to accommodate these new structures that would at a minimum add 800 new households to our diminishing housing stock. Bangor's um, job growth has been five to 6% over the last decade, yet we've lost five to 6% of our population. We need to reverse that, expand our tax base, uh, and allow more, more residents to get into a home cheaply and affordably. Um, uh, we can work in, in conjunction with the city council, our planning boards, and our local financial institutions to bring this a reality. We had a similar program on a residential side of things when I was a banker myself and, and a mortgage lender. Uh, we can use these funds to greatly increase the stock of housing and, and attract $100 million plus to the city of Bangor. Thank you. Thank you. Daniel Smith. Thank you very much. Um, those are all great proposals, but I wanna talk about what's going on right now in Bangor and across this country. Inflation, okay, the cost of living, the cost of goods and services. That's, that's gotta be priority. If you wanna win, okay, it stands for what's important now. Okay, we need to help the people of Bangor with some of these costs, okay? Look at all the houses that are being foreclosed upon, okay? The high taxes, okay, the high cost, they can't afford it. The last report came out, they're spending an extra $5,200 a year right now. I don't have an extra $5,200 a year. Now I've lived in Bangor all my life. Yes, Bangor's sitting on $20.4 million that they got from the treasury. Okay, I say you use that to help the citizens of Bangor who are struggling. Okay, that's what I say. And the other thing is to support your, your local police department. Okay, we have to make sure that the police department is funded. That's critical. Our public works our emergency personnel, our first responders, okay? We all know when things get tough, what happens? People get desperate, okay? It's, this is real. This is what's happening now. This is the, okay? Yeah, everybody needs affordable housing. I agree, 100%. But right now, listen, the issue now is let's help people with, with the high cost of living. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'm sorry, Stephen, I got people out of order, but if you could answer that, please enjoy. Our most pressing issue isn't just a Bangor one, but we're the place that feels its largest long-term effects. As county seat, we're the location for the jail and court system and will be far in the future. The need for a new county correctional facility is long overdue. The where and what its function will be is to be determined, but the need is growing daily. This building can't be patched together like the recent elevator and door control panels were. Sheriff Morton budgeted nearly a million dollars this year for housing at other jails due to our overcrowded and inadequate facility. I've talked to him, Chief Hathaway and Moffat of Bangor Brewer PD, and they all have stories of people in mental health or drug related crises and nowhere to go with them, yet they can't leave them where they are. Many times the only place is the ER at St. Joe's or Northern Light. Neither ER is really equipped to handle those crises and there have been assaults on the staff at both hospitals. So the person is arrested and put in jail with no access to the help they need. Arrestees are asked if they have a substance abuse disorder and 47% of them say yes. Chief Moffat was frustrated at picking up someone with multiple theft warrants and calling around to find a place to house them. Legalizing marijuana was touted as the cure for overcrowding, and it didn't work. Criminal justice and bail reform only goes so far. Turning violent or flight risk offenders out on low to no bail is a short-term solution that puts the public at the same risk as before the arrest. Our jail is overcrowded and inefficient, yet made worse by pandemic-caused court case backups. As residents in Bangor, we must support our sheriff and police departments and force the issue to the county and state and US representatives of funding a new facility that has incarceration for those that need it and secure treatment for those that wind up getting worse before they can hope to get better. Quoting Chief Moffat, doing something comes with a cost, 
but doing nothing also comes with a price. Thank you very much. <clears throat> we will now go to public questions. Um, most of the questions I have right now were submitted uh, beforehand. Uh, so this is the question I am going to start with. And uh, Tyler, I think I'll start with you. Do you believe the city has an obligation to provide safe and secure dwellings for all homeless persons? And if yes, by what date do you think this, um, uh, the city should commit to bring this about? Thank you for the question, Barbara. Um, I, th I think it's a city job to create an environment where we can increase the, the housing stock. I talked about my building a better Bangor program that would um, use these one times funds that, that came federally to um, spur development in this housing sector. So I, I think it's the city of Bangor's job to take a, a comprehensive look at our zoning policies. Um, certainly we, we wanna lend a hand up to anyone. And I think all of you in this community want, don't want to see people unhoused. Um, you know, we know that there's a, a myriad of, of problems the people who are unhoused in our community face from, from drug use, mental illness, um, maybe they drew, drew a bad, uh, you know, card, card in life and they were dealt a bad hand. Um, but we all want to see them uh, get, um, get back on their feet, earn, earn a paycheck and have some stable housing. Um, the way we can do that, again, is to be, be a community that, that is seeking that investment for more housing. Uh, we're losing population, um, and our housing stock has actually decreased in the last 10 years. So I will urge you, um, check out my website, rowforbangor.com, um, also facebook.com slash rowforbangor, that's R-O-W-E. Um, you'll I'll be detailing a presentation of my proposal for how to use those $20 million and increase our housing stock so we can meet the needs of our community for those working in Bangor, for those who are currently unhoused in Bangor and may not have a job. Um, it, it's, it's a multifaceted issue, uh, but the big, big place that as your city councilor, I can make a real difference is to attract that investment in affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you. Stephen Bro. do you want me to repeat the question? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> do you believe the city has an obligation to provide safe and secure dwellings for all homeless persons? And if yes, by what date do you think the city uh, should commit to, to uh, achieve this? Well, our city is in, as far as our buildings go, many, many of them are in decay. As I drive up and down Union, Ohio, and the, the lower sections of the city, yes, I do see buildings dying buildings in decay, buildings that have been cut up years ago and made into affordable housing to try to increase the housing stock 25 to 30 years ago. When we look at the overall effect of what was done then, can we, and you look at the buildings, can we say that that has really worked? What I would encourage is a public and private partnership to be able to expand into more of the rural areas of the city, uh, more multiple use dwellings and more small homes, tiny homes, if you will, uh, smaller short-term rentals. And we can't also forget, people all the time talk about sustain, uh, affordable housing. There has been very, very little talk on sustainable housing, green housing, um, house lots large enough to be able to provide food for the individuals. I, for one, would like to see more development of community gardens along that line. Um, do we have a, an absolute moral obligation? Yes, to be able to help people along. We cannot provide all things for all people. Sadly, we don't, we, we're a working class town. We don't have the infinite resources to be able to do that. Working with the state to be able to leverage some money would be wonderful. I would love to see more of that happen. Thank you. Mike Mayberry. Thank you, Barbara. I hear a lot of uh, long-term solutions. I think zoning regulation changes, mixed use, uh, the it puts the focus back on downtown. I think what is really 
needed is exactly what has been described is uh, you know the whole uh, the housing insecurity in Bangor is a tremendous need. I think we need to be assisting everybody that we can, but as Stephen has said, we have limited resources. What we should be focusing on is gathering resources from alternative sources to help us with wraparound resources. We are in a hub of Eastern Maine. We should act like that. We should be an area that has those resources for individuals who are in need, whether that be housing insecurity, food insecurity, what you, whatever you have it. Uh, this goes beyond just homelessness. This goes right to the point that more people need assistance. I agree here with Daniel that um, you know inflation, costs are rising. We really need to focus our efforts on providing resources to folks now. Changing policies, changing zoning regulations, increasing supply, those are all great solutions over the long term. What about our current neighborhoods? What are, what are we doing for our current folks who live in this city? We need to be helping them. We don't need to be putting a new unit downtown to attract more people to this city. We need to be helping the folks who currently live here. And my process for this is to put resources in the hands of folks who currently live here to either become landlords themselves or assist with the ownership of their own neighborhoods, providing them with resources, money or programs, uh, state assistance that will help them find solutions for their neighborhoods. Thank you. Daniel Smith. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Bangor Area Homeless Shelter. I, I, I want to applaud them for what they do. I know that it was the Ramadar Inn that housed some homeless people over the winter. You know why? Because that's what we do in Bangor. Bangor has great people. This is what I'm trying to say. Is yeah, we know we have problems, but we can come up with solutions. Okay. Now, with the high cost of living, what are the chances are that we're going to get more homeless people? Probably pretty good, right? I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. So we need to be proactive right now in addressing that. Okay. So we we need to talk to people in the community about some of their ideas of what they would do to house the homeless, okay? That's what we need to do. We need to get a conversation going, create synergy, get Bangor working for you. It's gonna make everybody's job easier, okay? So do we have a moral obligation? I believe we do, I believe we do. It's, it's, it's just because we have good hearts here. We're big hearted people in Bangor. At least we always were when I was growing up. So with that being said, yes, we do have a moral obligation. We, we should take advantage of what the Bangor Area Homeless Shelter does now. And another thing that we can reach out to do, ladies and gentlemen, is we need to reach out to the churches. Okay? We have great churches in Bangor. We need to reach out to them as well for ideas in the community as to how to address this homeless situation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Joe Leonard. Thank you. Um, yes, it is a moral imperative to help people and rehabilitate people back into society in a productive way, 100%. I'm not going to lie. This will not be a thing that will be solved overnight. But we still need a plan to prevent what we are experiencing right now. We can do many things. We can follow Atlanta's example by limiting home ownership extensively, by creating stricter ordinances on outside of the state homeowners. We can help establish a uh, social services needs and homeless shelters to give them more funding to not have them be a walk-in service, but a outstanding service that is always there to act as a safety net for those in trouble. We need to invest in our social services program, our human infrastructure. But we can also 
follow Texas's example by investing in a pioneering technology that is 3D printable housing. The University of Maine has a pioneer program for 3D printable housing that was just awarded over $30 million from the federal government to continue research more. We can invest in that here. That one project idea will not only bring affordable houses into the area, it will also bring good paying jobs to the area as well. I know that solution and many of these other solutions I bring up, they seem like they are out of reach, but this is the future of infrastructure. And Bangor, as we all know, are hardworking Mainers. We are hardworking people, and we can be a national leader in this pioneering industry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next question, and Daniel Smith will start with you. Can you name some current city efforts dealing with the opioid, opioid epidemic? Uh, and do you think they are working? And do you have any other ideas? Um, I don't think they're working. I, I, we do have a drug problem in Bangor. There's no question about it. And we, we need to do better in addressing that. I know that uh, it's, it's been discussed about having, bringing in some more centers for people to get treatment. And I got to be honest with you, I don't see that working because it hasn't worked in the past in Bangor. It hasn't worked. We have an opioid problem. All right, how about the fentanyl? Okay, did you see the, the stats on fentanyl? Over 100,000 people have died. Okay, ages 18 to 39. Now put it in perspective, only 41,000 people died from COVID at that age. Okay, so we have a, there is a, there is a serious problem. Now, let's be honest. We, some of the problems that we get here in Bangor is because of some of the policies that are being created somewhere else. We all know that. Okay, it's not the fault of Bangor, but we have to come together as a community to solve these issues. Again, I go back to the, the, the surveys. They work, you get the people involved and they, they feel like they're more of a part of the city. They, everybody has a voice. And I think that would be a great, these surveys can be quick, five to eight questions. Okay, the key is gonna be participation. Yes, they take work, but the benefits are there. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Mike Mayberry, can you, uh, talk about current city efforts dealing with the opioid epidemic. Uh, and do you think they're working at, or do you have other uh, suggestions? Thank you. Uh, I think the opioid crisis is uh, hitting Bangor uh, equally as difficultly as other uh, areas within the state of Maine. I think that we are not uh, immune to uh, this crisis. And I do think that there are a number of city programs that are working but the, the resources aren't there in a sustainable way that will help the vast majority of these individuals. I think that the challenge is that our um, current health crisis is overshadowing the opioid crisis. And I do think that uh, our hospitals and programs that are primarily healthcare based are being overloaded by other pressing issues. The compounding nature of an epidemic or a pandemic is changing the landscape of how our healthcare providers and other folks who provide these resources to those who are experiencing issues with uh, opioids are are able to actually you know help these individuals. So I do think that they are working, uh, but the the issue really is that there are compounding uh, factors that are changing the landscape. And frankly, pushing this out of the news and out of the cycle of information that people are getting. Um, I will say that it is difficult as someone who is an educator and someone who works with folks who may be abusing drugs of all kinds, um, as someone who is on call for a university, I do see the need uh, for our healthcare systems to help these individuals to rehabilitate, but they are 
at their uh, pressing point too. We need to give as much attention to our healthcare providers as possible. And to those who are going to provide these services, they need more resources and they need more assistance and they need more attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Joe Leonard. Thank you so much. Um, the opioid epidemic is a disease of despair. Over the pandemic, depression was on the rise and suicide rates were on the rise and alcohol related deaths heavily rose. This isn't just an opioid issue. This is overall something is not functioning in our economy. This is all related to economic problems. These issues are only going to continue to rise unless we address the economic issues that are at the center of the drug epidemic. No one wants to go out of their way to do opioids or heroin or any of these other death dealing uh, drugs. No one actually goes out of the way to do that. People are driven into these areas of misfortune because their lives are not considered in the grander scheme of things. People are turning to drug use because our economy has failed the working class in this country. Bangor is moving in the right direction, but we need to do more, so much more. We need to help our working brothers and sisters. We need to give more to public housing. We need to give more to public restrooms. We need to add more services, add more workers to social services. But we need to do much, much more, especially when we live in a country that does not guarantee health care as a human right. And we need to work with the state to acquire more funds for Bangor so that we can actually provide the services that are given to this city that are heavily relied upon by not just Bangor, but all of central and northern Maine. We are a hugely influential city and we are undervalued. And I will make sure that we are valued as such. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Stephen Brown. As I spoke of um, earlier, I believe that we need a new correctional facility, one that can provide short-term treatment to be able to help get people clean and sober, get them out of the immediate crisis that they're facing. Uh, many of the ideas that I have are more longer-term solutions. Um, I believe we need stronger penalties for people selling drugs not for those that are doing them. We need stronger penalties, a lot stronger at the state level for those that are bringing drugs in from out of state. Uh, drugs are being pushed in nearly every neighborhood in town. Uh, right on my own street, I see the results of this nightly. Uh, I've lived in and around Cape Heart for close to 30 years now. That used to be an area that had very, very low worker participation. Um, it's not now, but if you spend any time listening to the scanner or in any of the scanner Facebook pages, that neighborhood is worse than ever with drugs. Um, there are no real short-term immediate solutions besides getting folks the help they need. I would like to see more short-term shelters and short-term sobriety places. I would love to be able to work with the barn and to be able to gather more ideas from them on what works. But what we're doing right now, frankly, isn't. If you go into the park on 2nd Street daily, daily, there are needles on the ground. Numerous people will call and say, call the police department and say, hey, can you send somebody out here? You picked them up yesterday, they're back again. We've got to change something with what we're doing. Thank you. <clears throat> Tyler Rowe, do you need me to repeat the question? No, thank, thank you, Barbara. Um, when we talk about um, whether or not our response to the opioid epidemic is working, uh, we, we do really need to address the root cause of these issues. Um, 
it's not just people using drugs. It's we've got to look at the at the broader picture of why people are leaning into into using opioids and other drugs that that uh, keep them from reaching their fullest potential. Um, it's jobs. It's an economy that works for them. It's access to housing that they can afford, regardless of their um, socioeconomic status. Uh, if, if you're in the working class or middle class, if you can't afford a home to live in, um, if you can't get access to the job that you need, you can't get connected to social services in this in this city, you are going to get stuck in a pattern of behavior. Um, this is an issue that's near and dear to my heart. Before I started my business in March of 2020, I was managing a, a local business here in Bangor, and I had several workers who um, at various points in their lives and in their careers had gotten addicted to heroin, had gotten addicted to meth. Um, and some of them got stuck in the cycle, in, stuck in the system where they were paying you know, obscene amounts of, of the money they earned, you know, that should be used to feed their family to pay um, for methadone treatment. And, and this was drug court ordered payments. So, you know, we need to look at, at the factors that are causing uh, at the root of this drug problem. We need to listen to the, the users and the people who are addicted to these substances to find, um, you know, are the services in the city working for them? I, I talked recently just at the door of a retired police officer yesterday, and he told me the the best thing when he was on the force is when he could go out with with a um, social worker who worked for the Bangor Police Department. Right now we are understaffed. I think we have maybe two social workers on, on Bangor PD. We need to expand that so that um, our police department is staffed and capable to, to handle the issues, um, not just in a way with force, but in a, in a way reaching out to our neighbors and helping them get back on their feet and helping them get connected to jobs and affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Uh, Stephen Burrell, we'll start with you, and this is kind of a fun question. <clears throat> what neighborhood do you live in and why? And where um, are your favorite places uh, to spend time in our city? Hmm. Well, that's going to be a bit of a tough question to answer. Uh, I'll tell you why in just a second. I do, however, as I alluded before, um, I live on 76 Shepherd Drive. It's a nice, wonderful, quiet community. Um, it looks much like parts of the west side of Bangor. Um, it has a very, very neighborly feel. Um, I was fortunate enough to find a piece of property that fit my needs perfectly. Um, my wife and I are avid gardeners. And when we were looking at this house, um, it dawned on me that there are no trees in my backyard or my neighbor's backyard, and it faces due south. Last two years ago, we did 52 quarts of tomato sauce out of our own garden. Uh, I'm kind of a workaholic, uh, so my, my, the place that I am most is at work, but I would say that beyond a shadow of a doubt, the place that I have the most joy in spending is with my wife Rose in our own garden, whether it's out back or out front. One way or another, most of our free time is taken up providing for ourselves. Joe Leonard? Sure. So um, I live right in the heart of downtown, uh, one main street. I, uh, um, if you are honking at someone, uh, because you're late for work, I'm hearing it. Um, <laughs> and, um, I, I, I love being so close to our downtown businesses and just seeing, um, so many of our businesses, uh, go up and thrive and bring so many people to the heart of our city. It's, it's what really got me interested in, um, pursuing, uh, being on the city council uh, initially all the way back in 2020. And um, uh, this, right after I got out of uh, the, the army. And I mean, it, it is a close second, actually my favorite part of Bangor, actually. I, I, it's so much fun. You're so close to, the, to all these wonderful parks that we can walk to. They're beautiful, beautiful, wonderful parks. Uh, they do need restrooms. They need public restrooms. Uh, other than that, they're great. Um, and if I had to choose though, a, a, my favorite place to go to is, um, the Bangor city forest. 
Uh, I'm currently uh, in grad school for uh, pursuing an economics degree. And every time I uh, have um, a test that I need to like de-stress right beforehand or, um, or I have finals coming up, walking around in that forest is just so soothing. And that, that, that really is at the heart of like what Maine is in general, what Bangor is. We have such a natural beauty that um, we, we need to, we already appreciate it, but I think we can take a larger economic opportunity to really promote us more as also a even grander, beautiful tourist hub as well, especially as we're now seeing MDI being one of the most uh, traveled to uh, parks in the country. Thank you. Mike Mayberry. Uh, I live in Fairmount, uh, over by uh, the Thomas Hill Road standpipe. So yesterday was a good day in our neighborhood. Uh, we had the uh, Bangor Water District tours of the standpipe for the first time in two years, which is really nice to see uh, that back in um, operation for tours. Um, and in fact, I think Summit Park and the standpipe is one of my favorite places. When I'm you know, in my yard, I can see the standpipe. It's a beautiful figure. It's uh, a beautiful place to be. My son actually uh, calls it his water tower, uh, which is just really cute. Uh, he really enjoys uh, walking around there. Uh, and every time we're able to take a, a, a walk around our neighborhood, we have to stop and walk on the rocks along the way. Um, we moved here because of my son. We were uh, in Springfield, Massachusetts, and we are both, or, well, I'm originally from Maine and wanted to get back. We were growing our family and we settled on Bangor because of its family, um, you know, friendliness. Uh, we found our house on Thomas Hill Road um, because of the property. Uh, I'm also an avid gardener uh, and I have a fairly large uh, raised bed garden uh, and I too, uh, work on tomato sauce and all those other great things that come from our garden. And, um, you know, it's one of the few joys that I have is taking and spending some time in our yard and watching my son enjoy uh, this great city. You know, we, we, we wanted to be here because we believe that this is the great place to raise our son uh, and soon to be daughter, in fact. Um, so we are um, hopeful for the future of Bangor, um, but Bangor needs to live up to the bargain that it provided us. It was touted as a family-friendly city, and we really want it to be, and that's why I'm running. I want this to be a family-friendly city that I know my son will stay and enjoy his time. Thank you. Thank you. Daniel Smith? Yeah, wow, where do I begin? Uh, there's so many great places I love to be in Bangor. Um, I love to be at a ball game. I love to be at Cameron Stadium. I love to be at Hassan University. I live in the Hassan University area. Um, I like going down to the harness races at Bass Park, hung out there a lot in my younger days. Um, I love being at church on Sunday. You know, it's just too, you know, I've born and raised in Bangor. I've been here my whole life. I love the downtown. Uh, just so many great memories to share. You know, when I think back, uh, all the things that, we did in this community. Like I said, I think it's the, one of the greatest communities in the country. And I mean that. It's a great place to live. It's a great place to raise kids. And congratulations on gonna have another baby. Thank you, and uh, and that's, that's the other thing. I, I did a kids club on Wednesday nights and being around the kids is, is amazing. You learn so much from being around them. And uh, so being around the kids, just, you know, the sports fields, um, the church, probably the greatest place that I like to be. Thank you. Tyler? Thanks, Barbara. Uh, so Bangor staple is our, our, our neighborhoods. You know, um, Dom's, Dom said it before. Um, we are known for our neighborhoods. We are known for the togetherness we have in our little communities and inside, inside of Bangor. I live in the little city um, on Earl Avenue, uh, right behind Tri-City Pizza. And I 
probably indulge in a little bit too much pizza being so close. It's really dangerous being there. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I just, I love our neighborhood. I love how the neighborhoods network together, especially in the summertime. Um, you've got kids around going to the parks. You've got uh, community picnics happening, barbecues and the like. Um, that, that to me is just, it's that small town vibe that I, that I truly enjoy in Bangor. Um, as for places I really enjoy spending my time when I'm out and about, uh, especially in the summertime, is our waterfront area, our walkable waterfront and downtown. It's, it's great um, to go out, go out with your significant other, go out with your family, take your, take your child downtown. Um, it's very walkable. And I, I've got some ideas uh, about that, too. I, I'd like to see the city um, explore um, shutting down Broad Street again. Um, you know, uh, back in the summer of 2020, that was um, it was great to see. Uh, just more walkability in the downtown area. Um, I know there's certainly some needs uh, as far as the, as the businesses um, in back of Broad Street go, and we we need to accommodate those for deliveries. But uh, but I love our downtown. I think it's a it it's it anchors our city, and it's a great area for economic opportunity. It's a great place to get a meal and spend some time with your family. So um, those are some of the things that I enjoy about my city, and and uh, I I know a lot of you share in, in talking with you at your doors. Um, you love our neighborhoods. You love um, living in in a city that has the services we Bangor has to offer, but feels like a small town. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Moving on to the next question. What will you do to support night and weekend service of the community connector? Uh, Daniel Smith, let's start with you. I think the biggest thing to do is to say I already do support it because I, I write it. My son does. And I think that's the biggest way that you support it. And, and the other thing is, look at the gas prices right now. I think that's going to be a huge asset in the future for Bangor. Okay, I know there's been some talk about no flag stops. I've heard about that. Um, I, in the wintertime, I'm not so sure that's a good idea. But maybe in the summertime, it's something, you know, we could explore. But I think the biggest thing is, is that with the time that we're living in right now, it's, it's going to be word of mouth and promotion. Okay, we got to build it up. That's what it comes down to. Okay, it's just, in anything that you do, if you talk it down, it's probably not going to be successful. But if you talk it up and you promote it the right way, then, then we can have success at it. And uh, I'd like to see us continue that. Again, like I said, I, and I hate to throw this out there, I don't, in Washington state right now, they're changing their gas pumps to get ready for $10 a gallon. Okay, you know, I hope that doesn't come here. But if it does, we got to be ready. We have to be proactive. But we're Bangor. We can do it. Thank you. Thank you. Joseph Leonard? Sure. Um, so I, I mentioned this a few times in the past. Um, uh, we, I, I, and, I'll, and I'll get to transit in a second. Um, we need to develop a city application for smartphones to better connect the citizen to city services that works also in conjunction with the city website. Um, this application should also include uh, incorporating transit systems such as buses or um, working with um, other future technologies such as uh, potentially like a, a rail system that we, we absolutely need to be advocates for in supporting as well. Um, New York, Miami, Boston, all these cities already have these apps anyway. It, this is not uh, reinventing the wheel here. These applications work and they help promote the uh, use of public transportation further. So by making uh, transit 
much more accessible to both young people, young families, and anyone who uh, isn't aware of it, but is technology, technologically savvy, this would be a great inventive way to promote the transit system and to expand it further. Because right now, um, we, we need to heavily uh, use public services more than ever now, as we, we've just discussed earlier, rising gas prices, rising economic uh, living situations. It's uh, we need to work with the people banger to make their lives easier, not harder. Thank you. Thank you. Tyler Rowe. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, th I think expansion of our bus system to nights and weekends is critical um, to, to the success of the Bangor worker and, and our businesses. Um, I, I managed a restaurant in town for, for a number of years, and it was so hard to staff some of the late night shifts. It was so hard to staff on Sundays because, you know, a lot of our core base of employees relied on public transportation and our buses weren't running. I agree wholeheartedly with Joe. We need an app integrated, not just for our transit system, but for the city as a whole um, that is modern, um, and it, it can be implemented at a small cost. The technology is there. Um, like, it's, like Joe said, we don't have to re reinvent the wheel. Uh, there are technological solutions that we can implement tomorrow um, to, to invest uh, in, in an app that will help with our, our, our commutes, our commuters, our people who use the bus lines and for other um, infrastructure needs in the city. Um, I think we need to focus on the routes that are being utilized. Um, there, were, there was some studies done by some outside consulting firms, but I, I think we can we can even do better and just internally um, log how our bus systems are currently being utilized and really market our buses as something that is available to, to members of our community. I had a number of employees um, who didn't know how to use the bus system. They didn't know the routes to the bus system. And, and yes, it's available online, but we take for granted sometimes that, uh, you know, we've lived here for a number of years. We take for granted that we know how to use the bus system, that we know how to use our city services. We need to do a better job of marketing that to people who are moving into Bangor, who, are, um, who need access to our public transportation. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Stephen Pro. Well, um, I, we need our community connector. That is absolutely true. We must, as a city, support the citizens that use it, not make it harder. The community needs a strong, vibrant city service that is willing to serve its seniors it's disabled, it's lower income folks with no vehicle. As it's already been mentioned, we have a time of economic uncertainty coming. I'm projecting that bus ridership is going to go up, not down. Um, I was rather disappointed when I got a, an email from Food and Medicine informing me that drivers are supporting getting rid of the flag stops. As your counselor, I will vehemently oppose that. I will not allow our seniors, our disabled people, particularly in the winter, to have to walk to and from the bus stop in poor weather, particularly on the return trip when they're likely to be carrying groceries. Um, we're already moving forward with the results of the Stantec study to improve the use of technology, but probably the one thing that I will say, if elected as a counselor, I will march down to the Community Connector Office, and I will look at each and every one of those drivers and say, if you are not willing to serve the people of this city the way they need to be served, do us a favor, at the end of your shift, quit. Walk out the door. We do not need you functioning as an example of how the city conducts its business and provides service for its residents. Thank you. <clears throat> Michael Mayberry. Thank you, Barbara. Um, I think that uh, we have a lot of data um, on ridership. Uh, I think that there have been multiple studies cited by um, candidates here tonight. Um, I agree the community connector is an essential piece of the greater Bangor puzzle um, to get um, you know folks to and from either jobs or homes or uh, visiting friends and neighbors within the city. Um, we have a bus stop at Husson University, and we uh, have our students use the community connector quite often, actually. It's a resource that's valuable uh, to not only universities and businesses in this uh, city, but to 
Um, most everybody, I too have written on the community connector and I have enjoyed my time using it. I think that what we need to do is look at the data that shows which routes are used most frequently um, and figure out which routes are needed uh, on the weekends uh, in more frequency. Uh, I think that we have that data, we need to actually implement some of the data as well. I think we can offer sponsorships. You know, if there are businesses who rely on that bus for their employees, might they uh, try to help their employees by sponsoring bus routes? You know, is that something that local businesses would likely do to help make sure that their employees have access to their employer? I think that P3 works well for housing. I think it could also work well for transportation. With the rising prices on gas, I agree, uh, Daniel, I think that uh, we need to find creative solutions. I am not someone who uh, says I have all the solutions. I certainly don't. And I want to listen to those who use the community connector to figure out what they need so that we're not just making decisions in a vacuum, that we're actually helping the people who ride the community connector or use the resources here within the city of Bangor. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Mike, we'll, we'll stay with you and uh, for the next question, which is, uh, what do you think the city should do to reduce its carbon footprint? And along with that, would you support installing rooftop solar panels on school buildings and city buildings? Uh, I'll answer the latter first. I think that that is a uh, creative solution to a ever growing and challenging problem. Uh, I think the reduction of fossil fuel use is an important way to curb carbon emissions. I do think that I would support an installation of solar panels on uh, educational buildings. The problem is that these are costly efforts. Uh, they are subsidized in some way, um, but they are um, a very small piece to that puzzle of carbon emissions and uh, sustainable uh, practices. I think that what we really need to focus on is uh, finding ways to reduce our need on fossil fuels by providing individuals uh, with access to grants um, that provide them with the opportunity to uh, not use oil or uh, natural resources that aren't sustainable. I do believe that this is an incredibly important um, issue facing the city of Bangor. Um, you know, we just talked about the community connector and their efforts are don't go unnoticed um, to be more sustainable, um, but that's challenging on them. It, we need to figure out what is a solution that will um, not be as costly on the individuals uh, of the city or businesses within the city. Thank you. Thank you. Tyler Rowe. <clears throat> Thank you, Barbara. Um, as far as our carbon footprint goes in, in this, the addings, uh, potentially adding solar panels to city buildings and schools. Certainly, if um, if we can make this happen in a cost-effective way, uh, we all know that that solar using the sun's power is, is absolutely a renewable way um, to, to generate energy. So um, I, I would be certainly supportive of that. And I think we need to examine each project we take on uh, line by line. Um, does it make sense for in the context of the budget? Does it make sense in the context of what it's at? doing to reduce the, our car, carbon footprint. Um, I think a lot of people are already taking on uh, sustainable efforts uh, to reduce emissions themselves. I see lots of you um, really interested in sustainable gardening. Um, I see, I think our community cares about this issue deeply. Um, and and uh, I think as a city councilor, I can, I can help be a leader on that front. I can bring us together um, to find creative ways that we can um, you know, make our city more sustainable. Um, we can do this together. You guys have lots of great ideas. I've talked to so many of you and um, we need to build this into our comprehensive plan that we're working on right now. Um, our bus system, as, as Mike had mentioned, I'll echo that, you know, um, that helps certainly, you, you know, ride sharing, uh, that type of thing. Um, making Bangor as walkable as possible. Um, our downtown is very walkable. It's tough in the winter time. We'll all admit that, you know, um, nobody, <laughs> nobody wants to be walking out in the cold all the time. But, uh, you know, some of our neighborhoods also are, are lacking uh, the proper sidewalks. We have some wide roads that don't have sidewalks that make Bangor less walkable. And there's some, some really common sense ways. And I want feedback from, from our community members who, who say, you know, hey, we could use a sidewalk in our neighborhood. You know, it's, it's tough for me to ride my bike uh, down Stillwater. Can we explore some bike lanes? Can we um, explore some ways to, ex 
to make Bangor more walkable. Uh, it, it, it's a problem that we that we all can face together, and um, I think we need to really take a look of to to build that into our comprehensive plan this year. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen Brown. <clears throat> well, uh, that's an issue I've kind of been around for a long time. Um, I had asked during some council meetings, I think it was eight, perhaps 10 years ago, uh, when the gas conversion from oil happened out in Cape Heart, why solar didn't go on the rooftops then. Anybody that's been out to Cape Heart knows there are no trees taller than the roofs. There are acres and acres of solar siding available right there. It could have been readily done. And I got the same silence from that council then that I'm hearing right now in this room when we're not speaking. They simply didn't know how to handle that. I, when my wife and I bought what is our retirement home, I looked at the cost of solar, not to be green necessarily, but to become energy independent for ourselves. And I had two different solar companies come in, look at the amount of oil that was used over the last several years. My usage turned out to be approximate with the previous owner, and so did the electric bill. So we had multiple years of good records. Within 72 hours, they were able to give me an estimate on the cost of putting solar on my roof and installing a heat pump to replace the furnace so that I could then use enough electricity to offset all of my electric needs and the cost of running the heat pump. I got that in 72 hours. Last March, we were, the council was brought up and asked to sign on to a climate change plan. It's a year later, it hasn't happened. I actually called City Hall asking to try to go down that same road. How many gallons of oil, how many gallon, how many kilowatt hours of electricity do we use that year? They can't give it to us. Thank you. <clears throat> Daniel Smith. Thank you. Um, yeah, those are all great solutions. Uh, using the community connector, uh, reducing the carbon footprint, it's, it's important. Um, but we, we got to be realistic. This is the Northeast. We, we have some uh, challenging winters up here. And I don't think anybody really saw this coming. That's hit us right now. But everywhere you go, when I look around the landscape, I drive to FedEx and I see solar panels being built all over the place. They're everywhere. Huge fields. So they're coming. Okay, we got to continue to recycle. Okay, ride share is a good thing. You know, those, those are all great solutions. The other thing is, what's it going to cost the homeowner to have solar panels to switch over? Homeowners are struggling now. So we really have to take a good look at that to see, okay, is it, and, and the other thing is, is it cost effective? Has anybody, you know, has, has anybody done a survey with people that have solar panels? Do, do they work appropriately in the Northeast the way they should? The sun's not always out. Let's be honest. But again, any, anything we can do to reduce the carbon footprint in the community is a great thing. But again, we, we have to be realistic on it, you know, and, uh, and make sure that uh, we're not setting people up for failure. Okay, we wanna set people up for success in Bangor, not failure. That's important. Thank you. Thank you. And Joseph Leonard? Sure, um, I actually wanna echo uh, what Stephen brought up um, in terms of, um, um, energy independence. Um, many cities across the country are realizing the energy that's being provided to us from local corporations are effectively ripping us off. Energy is a human right. And they have the 
authority to raise prices whenever they want, even when it's not justified. And cities across the country are starting to realize that we need to look for other solutions, especially as we're coming across this uh, climate change catastrophe that's upon us. We can, as a city right now, reduce our carbon footprint by bringing to heel these companies that overcharge us and inappropriately use non-green means to expand its energy resources and its profits. Energy storage is actually something that is heavily under talked about as well. There are many means of storage that we can use, such as kinetic energy. We can use wind energy that can be utilized when there are high winds. And then when that energy is not being provided by wind, we can store that in elevator like shafts that are uh, engineered and planned out in blueprints. And we can incorporate those into our energy storage process. That's just one area of energy storage that, um, that, 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 that I can bring up here. But uh, to, 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 answer, to answer the solar panel questions, um, um, I think in a short-term solution, yes. I think investing in clean energy facilities is a good way to go as it will help us uh, bring jobs. Holden just invested into a solar panel field and that will help our efforts in fighting climate change. With that said though, we also need to consider resources that go into creating green, green energy. Copper is a key element in that green energy and it is growing scarce right now. So with that said, this is only a temporary solution. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, I'm sorry that that ends our uh, public session because I have at least 20 more questions and they range all over the place from unions and zoning and uh, what business sectors we would like to see, uh, the, the downtown, the, the arts organizations. Um, so I'm sorry we didn't get to all of our questions, but it is time now for our closing remarks. And we will go in the same order as uh, we drew for um, the opening remarks. So uh, Michael Mayberry, we will start with you. Thank you again uh, to all of you who attended uh, in person and virtually tonight um, and to the League of Women Voters of Maine uh, for hosting us. Uh, this has been a tremendous honor for me. Um, I think back to why I ran or why I'm running um, is really is my family. Uh, my young son um, asked me, um, you know, the other day why I w chose to do this. Um, and I said, well, I just really want to make a difference, um, one. But also, I have a passion for local governance. I believe that where we are in these times, um, we need to listen more. We need to uh, work together a bit more. Um, I have the utmost confidence and respect for our current uh, city council. Uh, for the folks who uh, work here in the city. I think that they are doing a tremendous job with the adversity that they're facing at this moment. I do think that we could uh, listen and be more transparent as a city with our resources, with our communications. I think that we could provide the citizens of this great city with more information, with more timely information, and have them be part of the process or feel like they're part of the process as someone who has a young family, I do feel a bit disconnected, and I wish that I was uh, more connected to uh, my city government. I also would like to say that I'm not a politician. I'm not someone who has all the answers. I'm certainly not someone who, um, you know, is here to for an agenda. I'm here to support not only my neighborhood but every citizen in the city of Bangor. Um, I am someone who deeply cares about my community. And I want our communities to thrive. And that's why part of my intent in running for city council is to provide opportunities that put the resources back to the neighborhoods, back to the folks who live in this city. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Joseph Leonard. Um, again, I, I want to thank the League of Women Voters for organizing this uh, forum. Um, but please go to their website, get involved, and become a member. They have done a lot of great work to get more representation of women in politics. And especially during these trying times, we need women more than ever to get involved in politics. Um, and thank you for everyone coming. Thank you at home for participating in this forum. Um, th th this is, I, I consider this an act of service. So, so thank you for coming here and listening to all of us. And I commend you for it. For me, service has always been an action 
that helped define in me a sense of purpose, whether it's volunteering to donate materials at food banks or swearing an oath to join the army. I, I, I've always strived to do more for others and to try and help others before myself. Um, and you know, as, as a current student of economics, I, I understand the economic situation in our country looks incredibly dire. I, um, it does not look promising. However, th there are, I just want to be reiterate, there are economic opportunities here that we are not considering, so, such as working with the University of Maine to help incorporate and develop its 3D printing initiatives. We can work with the university and the Maine National Guard engineers to incorporate this new technology and develop brand new, stronger and cheap, cheaper infrastructure um, that we can be pioneers in and use it to create jobs in Bangor. Um, I, I was just talking with Stephen, like we, we can look at energy initiatives that we, the city can own and um, use it to help fight climate change as well. There are so many solutions that we can consider, but we're just not acting upon. The, the, the future can be bright. I absolutely guarantee that. My name is Joe Leonard, and I'm gonna be knocking on a door near you soon. Thank you so much. Thanks again, Barbara, and the League of Women Voters for hosting this forum. Um, it, it's uh, so great to, to speak with all of you, both here and, and at home uh, online, who are watching this this forum. Um, I just, I just, I hope I've made it clear while I've talked to you tonight that I'm running for Bangor City Council because I'm your neighbor and I love my city. That, that's it. You know, um, I want to see our city grow. I want to see our city thrive. And uh, we, we've talked a lot tonight about um, s some larger macroeconomic factors that are affecting our nation, affecting our state and affecting our city. But I truly believe Bangor has such a great base of people. We, our people are our biggest asset. And together through these tough economic times, we can build a better Bangor. Um, I, I've, I've attended a lot of these visioning sessions with you. And, and I know a lot of you say we, we can make some changes um, to the way we look at our housing situation in, in Bangor. We can make some improvements to our public transportation. And uh, if I have the pleasure to be elected by you on June 14th, um, I, I, I look forward to lo working together with all of the guys who share the stage with me tonight, because I think all of you bring a lot of great ideas. And, uh, you know, we are leaders of Bangor, even though we're not elected, we are leaders of Bangor. Those of you out there who have great ideas, you're a leader in your community, whether you're elected to a position, whether you sit on a local board, whether you own a business um, or, or work from home, you are the leaders in the community. We need to hear from you how we can make this city a better place. Um, I, I've come up with some proposals with how to spend our um, $20 million that, that Bangor has um, and, and specific proposals I, I hope to share um, with the city council um, if, if they'll allow me. Check out my website, rowforbangor.com, facebook.com slash rowforbangor, that's R-O-W-E. And I, I just hope, I hope when you get in the voting box, when you have your absentee ballot, that you will consider Tyler Rowe for Bangor City Council, your neighbor, your friend, and uh, hopefully a future city councilor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Stephen Rowe. Bro. Thank you, Barbara, for putting this wonderful event on this evening. I'm running to represent the ignored, the seniors, the disabled, the disenchanted voters that feel city council overlooks them. I'm not against taxation. We need local more than state or federal. I don't mind paying city employees so they don't leave for the private sector. We need their experience on the job every day. But firstly, what people tell me and I listen is that taxes are a concern with inflation in the last months making people nervous for their finances and even staying in their homes. I wanna give them and all of you a better voice in the involuntary taxation of our mill rate and our spending in the form of voter approval. We don't have that on all but our most expensive projects. That needs to change. As a council of nine, our job is to be responsible and meet residents' needs with help from our department heads, yet let voters decide if and how we want to spend our tax dollars. As nine citizens, it's our civic duty to vote in a booth for those projects as we see fit, but always, always respect the will of the public we serve. How I feel on a particular matter is almost irrelevant. 
My vote should not and does not matter more than yours, the taxpayer and voter. Council listened when the public turned out to loudly voice displeasure over Airbnbs and boarding homes lumped together and allowed in parts of the city. The way they should listen. We need better voter turnout and participation in our city, not more power to less people. The government should be more involved with the government or the public should be more involved with the government of, by, and for the people. We've lost that along the way and I wanna change it for the good of our city. I have some very big shoes to fill in Councillor Dubé, but I'm ready to serve with open ears, dignity, a little fire and spirit that's been missing from Council the last few years. I'm Steve Bro, Quality Control Coordinator, Bangor Ethics Committee, Master Mason, Board Chair and Coach, Bangor Area Wrestling, Volunteer at Neighbors Helping Neighbors Food Pantry, and your next City Councillor. Find me on Facebook. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and Daniel Smith. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you to the League of Women Voters for having us all here. And I want to thank all these guys as well. Um, I, got, I got a son that's almost all your age, and I'd be proud of him. So I'm proud of you guys because you're stepping up in your community. I just want to read something that I wrote down, and I know I've talked on this, but collecting citizen feedback on how the municipality is doing with its strategic initiatives does of course take time and effort, but it offers, offers great benefits. Not only will you get a better idea of how your city is performing from their point of view, but you'll also make people feel more connected to their community by ensuring that every voice is heard. That's citizen satisfaction surveys. Okay, again, I, I wanna stress. We have great people in Bangor, some of the smartest people in the world. We need to take advantage of that, especially now. And we can do it. There's only, listen, there's no problems, there's only solutions. Okay, we don't have to fear. We'll get through it. We always do. Okay, we're Bangorians. I've lived here my whole life. I love Bangor. My kids lived in Bangor. So I'm asking for your vote on June 14th. I'll work hard. I'm not afraid to get dirty, roll my sleeves up and go to work. There's no shortcuts in life. It's hard work. That's what we got to do. We got to be proactive. And again, I'm asking for your vote. My name is Daniel Smith and thank you very much. Thank you all very much. I do want to thank the candidates for both coming out tonight and for running for, for office. Uh, it's, it's a lot of work. Uh, you need to educate yourself on many issues. It's knowing our city, and, and I appreciate it. Uh, I appreciate the people that came out and the people that uh, sent in questions before time and the people watching us now. We need informed voters. Um, and I hope uh, that you will uh, visit the candidates' websites and talk to them and find out, uh, make your, your, uh, your, your ideas known to them. Uh, thank you from the League of Women Voters, and please vote on June 14th. Thank you all very much. <laughs>